Good morning, Charity Church family. I am so glad you could join us this morning on this Sunday morning. I really do miss us getting to be together, but I'm very thankful for the technology that we have to be able to join together online. Now, first of all, before we um, dive into a message and a worship song, um, I want to take a moment to receive our tithes and our offerings today. Um, I, I think obviously we all know that these are unprecedented times that we're living in, but I want to say to you, I want to remind you that Jesus is absolutely the master at doing more uh, than what we thought he could with less than what we thought he ever needed. And I pray that you individually in your homes would have a fish and loaves experience at your house. And just like the little boy who had the fish and the loaves, he had to be willing to bring that over to Jesus. And when he brought it over to Jesus, Jesus multiplied that and stretched it to feed thousands of people. And I'm praying that you would see over the next several weeks and months that indeed the Lord is stretching out your resources and blessing you. Unlike ever before in our lifetimes, our personal giving right now, our surrender to the tithe and the offering is evidence and proof that we trust God. So in just a moment, we're going to play uh, a song here, and I'm going to encourage you to pick up your cell phone or another device that you're not watching uh, us live on right now, and go to www.bcharity.com forward slash give. And there you'll find ways in which you can participate in giving. Please live out your faith in your giving. And if you have questions about your giving right now and how to make that work, please feel free to email April Richardson at april.richardson at becharity.com. And I just want to ask you if you would take a moment as a family just to pray and consider giving a little bit beyond during this season for the church. Uh, my friends, I, when this is all over, I'd love to see that Charity Church, our church, never missed a payment. Not a, not, a, not a payment to IPL, not a mortgage payment, not a payment to one of our missionaries. Uh, I don't want to see us miss anything at all. And I would love to see that on the other side of this, that we didn't even have to tap into our savings account. Uh, and so that we could pick up right where we have left off in doing all of the things that God has called us to do this year. Additionally, I want to encourage you, keep on reaching out to each other via text, phone calls, and Facebook. Message each other and ask questions like this. Do you need any food? Do you need medicine? And, and just figure out how we can minister to each other during this time. So I have no fear about whether we can trust God. I have absolutely no fear at all about whether or not we can trust God. The question is right now is can God trust us? Can he trust us with his church, with, with his people? And I want to be faithful in the good times and in the bad times. And I trust that that is your mature perspective as well. So to again remind you of the kind of God that he is, I want to share just a real quick personal testimony. On Monday, all of this stuff had already been going on. And Shelly and I got news from our uh, CPA uh, that we had a tax bill. I kind of shared it on Facebook, but I, I didn't get specific. And I think I'm just going to be specific with you. And um, so we, we found out that we were going to owe taxes, federal taxes. We've never owed taxes before. And, uh, but this is the first time filing taxes together. And we found out that we were going to owe $9,200 on federal taxes. And that was, that was quite a devastating financial blow. And we had a piece. I had a peace. I knew God was just going to take care of this. I didn't know how, didn't know, you know, we're looking at, you know, all the stuff that's ahead of us over the next few weeks and months. And um, I'm not kidding you. My mom and dad and sister were in the house with me when Shelly came in that day from work. Uh, she had got the mail and she opened it up and her, I saw her just kind of facial expression change and she walked over to me. And literally two to three days after we received a $9,200 bill uh, for our federal taxes, uh, we had a surprise unexpected check in the mail for $9,300. Are you kidding me? 
I, I'm just blown away. And so just as my whole family there, we were just like, look at the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And so today we get to tithe on that. And by the way, I just want to make sure you know, I'm not tithing on what's left after I pay the federal bill. I'm going to be tithing on the full amount of that check. And the Lord is just always multiplying. And if you'll give God what you got, what you got will be amplified, magnified, glorified. So I want to pray over you and your household right now financially. And during the course of this next song, if you'll take a moment and give uh, with your cell phone or something like that via becharity.com. So Father, I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus. God, I pray that you'd show up. Lord, you were able to make coins appear in the mouth of a fish. You were able to take fish and loaves and multiply it so that thousands of people would be fed. God, we trust you in this season. God, you're moving in a mighty, mighty way. God, give, give every family out there right now absolute confidence and faith to know that you're doing something big in their household. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Be blessed as you give today. So I want to minister to you today on the subject of ministering to the Lord. And so often when we come to church or now that we can't actually be in the building together, even when we just walk into the presence of God or we dedicate a time um, to, to focus in on him, when we go there, we often go wanting to receive something because we have needs, we have desires, we have wants. And over the last couple of weeks, I've encouraged you to live selflessly especially during this season where so many people are consumed with the things that they need and the things that they want for themselves. And yes, absolutely, the Lord does have something that he wants to give to you, but it was in my spirit that over these, the rest of these 40 days where we're fasting and praying that we would turn our approach from ourselves and begin to minister to him, that we would minister to the Lord Jesus I, I know this is weird, but from your home right now, I want all of you together with me, say it. Say, look at Jesus. Ready? One, two, three. Look at Jesus. One more time. Look at Jesus. And I want to encourage you as you're fasting and praying and seeking the face of God right now to understand. I, I, well, first of all, let me just sh share with you from my own personal journey over the fa past few weeks. As I was fasting, uh, I fully anticipated that I was going to dig in and press in and that I would feel the nearness and the closeness of God in an increased way in my life. But something surprised me the almost two weeks ago that we began this fast. Since the fast began, in fact, just the opposite seemed to happen. I began to feel dry and, and alone and even uncomfortable and distant from the things of God. Maybe you can recognize what I'm talking about, that since you started that fast, you didn't feel an increase of the presence of God, but you just even began to feel like you were struggling even more so. And I was talking to the Lord about this, and, and you have to pardon me, I've got a, a bit of a cough still lingering. And the Holy Spirit just encouraged, encouraged me, and he reminded me of the 40-day fast that Jesus went on himself. 40 days, Jesus was in the desert. A desert is not a comfortable place to be. That is a dry and hot and lonesome place to be. And Jesus, when he was fasting, was there in that desert. He felt all the searing temperatures and the heat. Jesus was thirsty. Jesus was hungry. And guess of all the people who Jesus wanted to be close to him, guess who we know was there with him in the desert? It was Satan himself beginning to tempt him and to try him. And during the 40-day season, this 40-day season of self-inflicted uh, fasting and prayer, it wasn't the nearness of his father that he felt um, during that time. It, it, it was even the presence of the enemy and the tempter. He was there. Things were dry. Things were hot. It was not a pretty picture. But like Jesus always teaches us, for the joy that was set before him. So hear me right now. It's not that during the 40 days of this fast that we're going to feel the presence and the closeness and the anointing of God. It's 
It's on the other side of this fast where we get to experience those things. On the other side of the 40 days in the desert came the launch of his ministry and the release of his anointing that was in him. It was the pressing and the crushing of the desert that produced the anointing within the vessel of Jesus that would one day be brought out of the desert and into the world where there were hurting people who needed ministry. So continue right now. I want to challenge you. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't give up coronavirus or no coronavirus or whatever is going on fast and pray and seek God for the joy that is set before you right now for the joy that's on the other side of all this and what's happening in us right now during this 40 days of fasting and praying and seeking him it's deep it's beneath the surface it's unseen right now and do not compromise it do not um, uh, be persuaded to stop doing it don't break your self-imposed or your holy ghost directed guidelines see because the holy spirit is doing a heart work inside of us our hearts are being turned to the father and what's so wonderful about this exchange is that when the hearts of the children are turned to the Father, the heart of the Father is turned to the children. And I want you to right now imagine a moment when God gets all of us and we get all of him. So, these 40 days and this message today, this Sunday, is about us and our ministry to the Lord. Our ministry to God. And I know what you're thinking, well, does God need ministering too? You know, aren't we the ones in need right now? Why does God need us to minister to him? See, when we hear the term ministry, we often think about the needs of the people because they are so great and there are so many. And a few weeks ago, I mentioned how um, I had been at a conference and discovered that all of these churches were talking about the thing that they did best and the thing that so many of them talked about as doing best were social justice issues. And, and I began to realize <coughs> no one was talking about eternity and no one was talking about repentance and no one was talking about seeing souls saved and people rescued from hell and on their way to heaven. And everybody was talking about some social justice issue and churches have become these social justice clubs. We cannot be a biblical church without addressing social causes, but you can address social causes and issues and not be a biblical church. I want to be a biblical God-honoring church. The church is first and foremost about the eternal soul of mankind. Secondary to the eternal soul of mankind is the charge of God to bear one another's burdens, to love your neighbor as yourself, to lift up the oppressed, to, to defend those who are defenseless, and so on. That's important, but it's only second to the most important thing. And we will not be able to totally eliminate suffering from this world, but we can minimize it, and so we should. As a matter of fact, we should do all the good that we can. But we must never forget this one thing. Our first ministry, our number one priority, is that we minister to the Lord. That's our first ministry. And this is an area that is not frequently taught, understood, or even thought about in churches. And it could be because the needs of the people are so great and so many and because uh, we understand that, that, that God, <coughs> who is the creator and the sustainer of all things, is all sufficient in himself. We might not think for a moment that maybe God needs to be ministered to, but as we look into what it means to minister to the Lord, we'll see that this ministry I'm talking about is preeminent. And that means this, that it takes precedence over any and all other forms of ministry. So as a church, we've been reading together through the Old Testament, and we discovered that when the Lord gave the, the Torah um, at, at Sinai and established his people as an organized worshiping army instead of some aimless, wandering group of people, he established an entire tribe who had the primary role of this one thing, ministering to him. An entire tribe of Israel was designed with one thing, 
in ch- one thing they were charged to do, and that was to minister to God. Deuteronomy 18, 5. For the Lord your God has chosen them and their descendants out of all your tribes to stand and minister in the Lord's name always. <clears throat> First Chronicles 23, 13. Aaron was set apart, he and his descendants. We're talking about the Levites, the Levites. So they were, they were set apart, he and his descendants forever, to consecrate the most holy things, to offer sacrifices before the Lord, to minister before him, and to pronounce blessings in his name forever. As a matter of fact, when King David, <coughs> excuse me, when David brought back the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, he appointed and personally hired and financed 4,000 Levites for the sole purpose of praising God with musical instruments that David himself had fashioned and provided in 1 Chronicles 23, 5. And these singers and these musicians, they were not there to provide entertainment for David. They were not there to provide entertainment for the congregation, for the church, but they were there to offer 24-7 day and night worship before the ark of the Lord's presence to minister to God to minister to the Lord and when the Lord gave detailed instructions on the building of the tabernacle its function and its purpose was to minister to his presence and thereby provide a dwelling place to meet with his people The whole design of the tabernacle and later the temple built by Solomon was for one purpose and that was to minister to God, to minister to the Lord. In contrast, right now, especially at a time like this, we should ask, what is the design and function of most of the church's ministry today? Is it to minister to us, to get something for us, or are we really working to minister to God himself. Now this is a moment in time that we've been given that's allowing us an opportunity to sober up spiritually, to sober up mentally right now, to take an account for who we are and who we have become and how we are living. And when we make this, all of this, church and life and the world about us we've lost our way when when this is about me getting what i want i want my healing i want my miracle i want my want i want my need i want then we've missed it and it's not about god and we need to look at jesus again and remember that everything we need is already in him and in fact if we'll just turn our face turn our eyes to jesus he is enough let's minister to him so what did ministry to the lord look like in the old testament Here's what it meant. It meant two things, worship and intercession in all of its forms. We already saw how David appointed Levites to minister to the, to the Lord in worship with music and praises. In 1 Chronicles 16, 4, he, talking about David, appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to extol. The word extol means to praise enthusiastically. So this is where it doesn't matter what denominational background you come from, whether your church practices this or not. It doesn't matter what your church practices. It matters what is biblical. And the Bible tells us that we're to extol or to praise enthusiastically. So let me read it again. He, David, appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to extol, thank, and praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Second Chronicles 29, 11, My sons, do not neglect your duties any longer. The Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him, and to lead the people in worship and present offerings to him. I love that, that it says, do not neglect your duty any longer. I'm, we are a people. We are a nation of priests. We are, we're a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. And God has called us to praise him. And our first and foremost ministry must be to God himself. Extolling, giving thanks, praising, standing before him, burning incense or prayer. And, and offering burnt offerings ourselves as a living sacrifice. These were all expressions of worship and intercession and, and thus ministry to the Lord. Joel speaks of the priests ministering to the Lord in this way. In Joel 1.9, the priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. In in verse 13, put on sackcloth, sackcloth, you priest, 
and mourn. Well, you who minister before the altar, come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. In Joel 2, 17, let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people, Lord. See, there's something about our own ministry to the Lord right now where we should be turning our eyes up to heaven right now and weeping and wailing and mourning and extolling and thanking God for his goodness and interceding for our people right now. I've seen a picture that just kind of sticks in my mind concerning even why we're not meeting right now. Uh, the, the fact that we're not gathering and meeting in this building together is in fact an act of intercession. I, I saw a picture that kind of demonstrated this and it had like 10 matches and, and, and four of them were, were lit and one match was removed. And because one match decided to break the, 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 the connection there, it was a, a form of intercession stopping the, the rest of the matches from catching on fire. In fact, even our, our, our not gathering right now is, is us being removed from, from what this virus would like to do. And, and we are interceding as a church and praying and believing and stopping and thwarting the plans of the enemy. I just declare that in Jesus' mighty name. So not only do we minister to the Lord with joyful song and with instruments of praise, but at times, as priests today, we may be called to minister to before him with weeping and tears of intercession, allowing our hearts to break with the things that break his heart. See, both are feasting on the abundance of his goodness with joyful hearts as well as our fasting on behalf of his people with broken and burdened hearts that ministers to the Lord. And there are times we get to come into this place and celebrate. And then there are times like maybe even today on this Sunday where your heart's sick and you're, bro you're broken and you need to minister from that place of brokenness. We also read of how young Samuel who was 11 years old when he was called by God, learned to minister to the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 11, the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 18, but Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Now, this is descriptive of what he was wearing, a linen ephod. Why, why are we talking about what in the world the guy is wearing? We're talking about it because the clothes that this 11-year-old boy was wearing, these were priestly garments that only a priest had the right to wear. And we minister to the Lord in the spiritual and in the practical. So I want you to imagine right now this 11-year-old little boy who's being trained under Eli, who's wearing a linen ephod well before he should ever be doing that according to his age. But while learning the role of a priest and wearing the ephod and, and learning to hear the voice of the Lord, you know, Samuel would have been also, he would have been given, you know, menial, simple task. He would have participated in practical jobs like maybe you're having your kids do right now, like sweep the floor. Uh, you know, dust the furniture and, and just cleaning up around the house of the Lord. Even the grown up adults who served as priests and Levites, they were assigned practical somewhat menial tasks and duties they had to trim the wicks and, and remove the ashes from the the burnt offerings and putting out the bread of the presence and then disassembling and carrying the parts of the tabernacle and then putting it all back together again when God said it was time to move I want to say that this I'm, I'm, I'm saying all that to say this there are times when our simple acts of seemingly menial task performed in his presence from a heart of worship, tasks that may go unnoticed by man, they serve as ministry to our God. They bless his heart. So all of the examples of ministry to the Lord that we've looked at so far, all of those come from the very same Hebrew word, sharath, S-H-A-R-A-T-H, which means this, to attend to, to minister unto, to serve or wait on. But in the Psalms, we find another dimension 
of ministry to the Lord. In Psalms 134.1, praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Psalms 135.2, praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, you servants of the Lord, you who minister in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Here, the word minister is translated from the Greek word or the Hebrew word amad, A-M-A-D, which means to stand, to abide, to continue, to remain, to tarry, or to stay up. And there are times when our ministry to the Lord is that we would simply stand, that we would abide, that we would continue, that we would remain, that we would tarry, or even just stay up late at night in his presence. When Jesus asked his disciples in the New Testament, could you not stay awake for just one hour with me? They missed an opportunity to minister to their Lord by just staying up with him and remaining by his side just for those moments. So whereas the first meaning of ministry to the Lord, Sheriff carries the meaning of, of, of waiting on in the sense of a waiter or a waitress serving someone. The second, Ahmad, means to wait on in the sense of a watchman staying awake or someone simply staying or abiding in his presence. Yes, we are called to go minister to this world and to minister to his people. Indeed, Jesus did say to us, as much as you have done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. But let us not become so busy and so focused on the needs of the people around us that we miss our primary and first calling, and that is to minister to God himself. When Mary stayed, or Ahmad, at Jesus' feet, the Lord said that she has chosen the better part and that it would not be taken away from her. Martha was in the kitchen doing her thing. Everybody was doing their thing. But Mary wept at the feet of Jesus and remained. There were things she could have been doing, maybe even things you, we could say she should have been doing. But she put all of those things down and she ministered to the Lord. Being with Jesus, being in his presence right now is your number one most important ministry. That you be in his word, that you worship that you sing praises to him, that you extol him, that, that, that you thank him, that if he tells you in the middle of the night, get up and stand and, and wait, then you do that. that if, if he says, break your heart right now and, and wail and mourn, then minister to him right now. See, our tears are the oil that, that came at a great cost to us. Our tears should be used to wash the feet of Jesus Christ. There's no greater consolation when you're so broken hearted that all you can do is cry. The best thing you can do is use those tears to wash the feet of Jesus. Tears that are being squeezed out of your life right now. The oil was so priceless and precious because it came from the place of pressing and from the squeezing. It's the, it's, it's the essence of the struggle and of of the fight that we're in right now everybody here wants we all want to be pure gold but none of us like the fire everyone here wants to be a diamond but no one wants the pressure we don't want to go through the stuff you got to go through to become that beautiful see these pressures only exist to activate something in our life the presence of God the anointing problems only exist to activate a place where our faith can be exercised so we often just get so lost in what we're achieving for God and God keeps bringing us back to what we're becoming for him and what we achieve by obtaining goals isn't nearly as as important as who we're becoming in the process of getting there and I want to challenge you in the, in the midst of this perilous time and trial that we're experiencing right now. You must believe and you must know, you must have a confidence that God is developing something in each and every one of us. See, blessings always come with burdens. 
children are a blessing I know maybe you're questioning that right now after having them with you for a couple of weeks but but children are a blessing but they're also a responsibility there's a burden they keep getting hungry they always want more food and their feet keep growing and they need more new shoes and clothing but there's a blessing in all of it so what is God squeezing out of you in this fast what is God squeezing out of you during this trying time right now in this perilous and and and, and troublesome time during this season of self-inflicted pressure right now if you're cooperating and in obeying the Lord in the fast so as we minister to God with the brokenness and availability of our lives remember God needs nothing we're not ministering to God because he has needs but because he has desires that's why we minister to him not because he has a need but because he has a desire he desires to abide in the praises of his people he desires to have a relationship with us and we can only come to that relationship through the confession of our sins and recognition of God's saving act of redemption through his son Jesus Christ so we have to come to a realization of the absolute power and the absolute authority of God over everything and begin the process of, of grasping the depth of his love for us and what he did through Jesus Christ on that cross redemption redemption he wants to redeem your life right now if you are watching right now and I, I hope you are I hope that that I, I'm not glad that all of these bad things are happening don't get me wrong I'm not saying that but I hope that in the midst of these bad things that are happening that it's sobered up your spirit and sobered up your mind and that it's causing you to think about the realities of life and death and so right now first and foremost are you born again are you a believer I'm not talking about did your parents have a faith or your grandparents have a faith you won't make it to heaven on their faith you have to have your faith where you've repented of your sins and you've come to Jesus Christ and, and you said, Lord, I'm not going to have anything to do with those acts anymore. I repent. Repent doesn't mean say I'm sorry. Repent means turn around. Turn around. Do an about face. Walk in a different way. And so right now, it's not a scare tactic. But the fact is that things are scary right now. And with all the things that are going on in this world right now, the thing that you have most to do is to prepare for eternity, to make sure that you're ready to spend eternity with Jesus in heaven, not in hell. I don't want you there. You don't want to be there. Jesus doesn't want you there. Jesus is doing everything he can to reach you, to rescue you. So I want to ask you just to simply have a conversation with the Lord right now. That's what prayer is, a conversation. And just ask him to come into your heart ask him to come into your life Lord Jesus I ask right now that you would come into my heart into my life forgive me of my sins Lord I repent for everything that I've done that hasn't pleased you that hasn't aligned with your word that's been hurtful to others or hurtful to myself God I turn away from those things and I walk after you I seek you now and Lord, I pray that this would be genuine from my spirit and that I would never return to those ways again. But from this day forward, I would be a new creature, a new creation, born again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to challenge you to do something crazy. Even if you are, are quarantined in your house, won't you get somebody in your house? I don't care if it's your 10-year-old. Have them baptize you in your bathtub as an expression. Put it on um, Facebook and let the whole world know that even right there in your home, you received Jesus Christ as Savior. You got baptized and that you are a new creature, a new creation, and that you have been born again. And with that, everybody else, all the believers that are watching this right now, listen, our greatest worship is that we give ourselves to him. That is our greatest worship. Fully, completely unabandoned. I challenge you with that. Charity Church, I love you. I bless you. And I want you to keep your faith and, and keep moving forward. Keep, keep being strong in the Lord. I bless you. I thank you, and I can't wait to see you all again, and uh, see you soon.